Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kirkville United Methodist Church as we are gathered here in person, but also as we are gathered online from a distance. And so we welcome those who we do not see your face, but yet we know that you join with us. We pray that you'll be inspired. We pray that you'll feel the warmth of the fellowship that we share together. You'll notice uh, that we have some wonderful flowers that grace us this morning. They are left by the family uh, of Betty Walters to uh, grace our work time of worship as we then uh, celebrated her transition from this life to the eternal life that is prepared for her and is waiting for her in heaven with Jesus Christ. And so we thank God for that. Our bulletins also are in honor of her, given by the United Methodist Women. And you also, if you want to, in future weeks, want to uh, provide bulletins, uh, you may do so. Uh, there's instructions in the bulletin for you to be able to follow to do that. And I know Jean Chase has also um, taken up and, and uh, provided the bulletins for next week in honor of her husband. So we thank you for those gifts. And so we then start our time of worship. Worship embodies a number of spiritual and emotional factors. Worship is to feel in the heart. I do not apologize for using the word feel. A.W. Tozer writes, as Christians, we are not to be people without feelings. I certainly do not think we should follow our feelings solely. But I believe that if there is no feeling in our hearts, then we are as good as dead. Certainly, there is danger in relying upon our feelings only. If you woke up one morning with no feeling in your arms at all, you would call a doctor. Because anything without feeling, you can be quite sure, is dead. Real worship is, among other things, a feeling in the heart that is appropriately expressed. You can worship God in any manner of appropriate to you by feeling in the heart and expressing that humbling but delightful sense of admiring love for God. Let your hearts dictate your worship to the God you love and who loves you. Would you join me in our opening prayer? Oh, come, dear Lord, and fill my heart with blessed desire for thee. I lift my heart, anticipating the shining of thy blessed face. Amen. I invite you to join me in a brief chorus called Worship, Here I Am to Worship. Here you are to worship. Let's worship the Lord with the fullness of our heart. Light of the world, you stepped out into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, this in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, 
Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. Our call to worship comes to us from Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Who are we? We are people struggling to be faithful to God and our principles. We look for guidance to find our way. The Lord is our shepherd. It is he who provides all that we need. I believe this in my head, but my heart questions the Lord's promise. I am not always certain that I should what I do and quickly take control when I know I should wait and trust God to act. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. God has given me my mind in my experiences. Should I not trust them? In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. But how can I be sure? I understand his will for me. Build a temple in your heart for the Lord, and he shall come to reside there. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness, and your way will become clear. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. As I praise you, May my way become clear. I invite you to rise from where you're standing if you're able and join your voice with mine as we sing our first hymn, God of Love and God of Power. Grant us in this burning hour Grace to ask these gifts of thee Daring hearts and spirits free God of love and God of power Thou hast called us for this hour We are not the first to be Banished by our fears from thee Give us courage, let us hear Heaven's trumpets ringing clear God of love and God of power Thou hast called us for this hour All our lives belong to thee now our final loyalty saves are we whenever we share that devotion everywhere. God of love and God of power, thou hast called us for this hour. God of love and God of power. Make us worthy of this hour. Offering lies if it's thy will. Keeping free our spirit still. God of love and God of power. Thou hast called us for this hour. Praise God. Please be seated. I have, uh, you who are here, and maybe you can hear it over uh, our broadcast, but there is a particularly lovely, lovely voice, 
and that stands out that I hear that comes from this side of the sanctuary, and it comes from Marion Eaton Clark. And we're so glad to have Marion with us, and she has consented to bring us a witness today. Oh, I do too, but she's not here. Where's, oh. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Good Did you morning. see, I got three pages of notes. Well, guess what? The <laughs> notes are going out the window, and it's all coming from the heart. I'm 80 years old, so consequently, I've had a lot of things happen in my life. There's been many, many, many obstacles, but I have to say that I don't ever remember saying, God, why is this happening to me or to my family? I wind up praying, and I can tell you that 99% of the time, I didn't know what the issue was, and I'm praying the Lord's Prayer, and I'm saying the 23rd Psalm. And there was many nights when I said those over and over all night long with hardly any sleep for, to go to work the next day. Now, as you all know, I lost a daughter to cancer, and I see that we have a lot of people here who are going through cancer. Can you hear me okay? Okay. And pray for them. Pray that they're guided to go through whatever lies ahead for them. It's not easy, it's rough, and, but we ask for guidance. We don't say, why God? Why are you doing this to me? You, you ask him to help you, to guide you through. And then there was a time when, after Penny had passed away and uh, what have you, and I would say to God, over and over again. You know, all I care for, I know I'm in my 70s, but all I care for is to have somebody come into my life, a man, who we can love each other wholeheartedly and enjoy life together. Well, lo and behold, he brought Joe into my life. We had a wonderful love. We had a wonderful marriage. We had a wonderful companionship. He was he was everything. We were everything to each other. But he had a lot of medical issues. I never begrudged that I had to be there guiding him, helping him through his medical conditions. They all started before we ever met, so the cat's been out the door, so now we just got to live with what it is and make the best of the situation. Thank God and I do thank him, that I was able to get him to go to a neurology doctor, a nephrology doctor, I'm sorry, regarding the kidneys. And I said to him, because you don't tell Joe what to do. Oh, no, oh, no, 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 don't do that, no. Because if you tell him to sit, he's going to stand, okay? So I said, let's just go to the doctor, see what they have to say with the things that is at this time, because he'd already been in the hospital, had to have blood transfusions because his blood count wasn't high enough for the kidneys to work. He consented to go. We went, from the time we met, I went to him with every doctor's appointment. And so we went and we saw the PA a couple of times, and then we actually saw the doctor. And he sat back in his chair, leaned it up against the wall, and he just sat there and he talked to us. We asked questions, Joe asked, I did, only me. And uh, so the doctor said to him, if it gets to the point where you wanna have dialysis, will you do it? Joe said, no, I'm not doing dialysis. Very abruptly. We go on into a conversation, we're asking questions, he's telling this, telling that. We can have shots to bring up the blood count and blah, blah, blah. So anyhow, uh, he come back and he asked him again. He said, if it gets to a point, would you do dialysis? And Joe immediately said, no, he would not. 
Well, as most of you know, that both Joe and I got COVID at the same time. I didn't ask God why. I was trying to figure it through my mind is how did we get it? And it finally came to me two weeks down the road and by that time it was too late to do anything about it. But anyhow, he was in the hospital and with his kidneys, when you, as bad as he and I had it, you don't wanna eat, you don't wanna drink, you don't have a mind of your own, you don't have a body of your own. I don't know how to describe it. It was like an out of body circumstance. And so he was in the hospital not eating or drinking, and I'm home, forcing, and a bird would have eaten more food than I was eating. I just didn't want any food. Consequently, this is what brought the kidney failure for Joe. And they asked him again in the hospital, would you do dialysis? He said no. They called me, and I said, no, he said that very emphatically at the doctor's office, he would not do it. So we knew that this was going to be end of life. I went through a lot of different thoughts and emotions and what have you, but all this time that he's in the hospital, I'm home, I'm praying. I'm just saying, God, help us, guide us through this. Be with Joe, help him. And then when they allowed me to go in and see him during the day, uh, when they put him into a different thing, I had to wear the hard hat and the mask and put the gown on, and that hard hat hurts, let me tell you. And, but I was able to go in and see him. And uh, when he got in there, he said to me, I can't wait for this to be over. Unfortunately, it took about four weeks for it to happen, but we were together. But I didn't say to God why. I just said, thank you, God, for giving us both a chance to have a happy life together. And thank you for bringing us together. And that, and at the end, I was with him when they put him into the comfort care with hospice. I could stay there day and night, which I did do, except run home, feed the cat in the morning, or the dog, I should say, let the dog out, feed the cat and the dog, wash up, shower, whatever the, it was, go back, come home at night, feed them, and sit down on the couch and watch Wheel of Fortune for a half an hour. Lady on this side, the cat on this side, my hands are busy, let me tell you. And that we were doing that even when I, Joe and I, in the evening, we'd sit there and watch it. Dog on one side, cat on the other. Of course, now I've got to babysit three cats, so I'm having lots of fun. But anyhow, I don't feel we ever ask God why is whatever has come into our life. We say to him, help me through it, help us through it, be with us. And every day on my way to work, I pray. And basically, it's the same thing over and over again, but I pray for my family, I name different people, I pray for our country. I pray for the President of the United States. I pray for our elected officials. I pray for our employed government workers. And I've been praying for our essential workers. But I also say thank you for the birds and the bees, the flowers and the trees, the heavens and the earth, and all creatures here below. And I think I'm missing some of it because I'm not thinking too good right now. But anyhow, I'm thanking God for everything that he has given us. I thank you for the blessing that you give me. Every day is a blessing from God. It's not a blessing from us. It's nothing that we've done. It's all from God. I thank him for seeing me through, for helping me no matter what. And on my way to work, I say, guide me when I'm talking to the clients on the phone and helping them. Help me to do whatever I have to do. So this is what I'm trying to say to each one of you. Don't say, why God? Why has this happened to me? Why, I mean, I even totaled Joe's car. I was more upset than him. He said, well, at least nobody was hurt. I said, yeah, I know, but, you know. (laughs) But things happen for a reason. And every obstacle in our life 
that we encounter and we make it through, I take it that it's a learning lesson from God. He's educating, and he's preparing us. He is preparing us for something that's going to happen down the road. Like I took care of Leo for years, then I took care of my daughter Penny when she had the cancer, and then I was there to take care of Joe. And of course, I've had my grandson that I've been dealing with too, who had a bad car accident. But he prepares us for what's coming down the road. We don't even realize it at the time, but I do believe that that is what he is doing. Just thank God, pray for everybody throughout the whole world. I don't care what color their skin is. I don't care what country they live in. They need our prayers. They need, and I even pray that millions of people every day will accept Jesus as their savior and that they will believe that God is the ruler of our lives. And with this country right now, I think we need to pray for our leaders that we can have what this country was founded for. Anyhow, that's my word for today, and let's all join in the Psalm 62. Oh, we've got our song. Okay, I was waiting for it to get up there. There you go. <laughs> I find my rest in God alone. He is the one who saves me. He, he alone is, is my rock. rock. He, he is, is the, the one, one who saves, saves me. me. He, he is, is like, like a, a fort to me. To me. I, I will, will always be secure. How long will your enemies attack me? Will all of you throw me down? I'm like a leaning wall. I'm like a fence that is about to fall. You only want to pull me down from my place of honor. You take delight in telling lies. You bless me with what you say, but in your heart, you call down curses on me, Selah. I will find, find my, my rest, rest in God, God alone. He is, he is the, the one, one who gives, gives me hope. hope. He, he alone is my rock. He, he is, is the one who saves me. me. He, he is, is like, like a fort to me. me. I, will I will always be secure. secure. I depend on God to save me and to honor me. He is my mighty rock. He is my place of safety. Trust in him at all times, you people. Tell him all of your troubles. God is our place of safety, Selah. Ordinary people are only a breath. Important people are not what they seem to be. If they, they were weighed on a scale, scale they, they wouldn't amount, amount to anything. anything. Together, Together they, they are, are only a breath. Don't trust in money you have taken from others. Don't be proud of things you have stolen. Even if your riches grow, don't put your trust in them. God, God I, have I have heard, heard you say, say two things. things. One, One is, is that, that you are strong. strong. The, the other is that you, Lord, Lord are loving. I'm, I'm sure you will reward each person. person in keeping, keeping with, with what, what they, they have, have done. done. And now we're going to Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labors of my hand can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, 
helpless look to thee for grace. Thou like to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, all I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see the on thy judgment throne, rock of ages left for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Thank you, Marion, for that beautiful witness to us and leading us in that responsive reading of Psalm 62. As we come to our time of sharing joys and concerns, we lift up the birthdays of Clark Spaulding and also of Karen Miller. And if you'd like to write her, you can find it in your directory, her address, in her winter uh, address, that is. And uh, if you find that you uh, need to update the directory, please let me know and I can do that. I want to share with you just our updated prayers. There's a large list, even beyond this, that have been given to us to pray. But I'd like to lift up specifically uh, the family of Betty Walters, the family of Kyle McShane, who was a young man who uh, was killed while felling a tree, and his brother found him a day later. And, um, and so I've been talking to Daniel, and, and uh, I ask that you might pray for he and his family. There are people of faith, strong faith, but uh, faith can be tested, as Marion uh, has said. So uh, we also remember Emily Barber, who is terminal with Parkinson's disease. Ruth Peckham, who is 105 years old, a woman of faith who has lost both her sight and her hearing and is, is struggling. And I know that her son would ask us, Ron Peckham, uh, who is one of the heads of CNS Corporation, would ask us to be praying for his mom. We want to pray for Jen, no last name, who has terminal cancer. It's coming to a head. And uh, the other concerns there before us have been concerns that have been on our list for several weeks that we can be in prayer for. Are there other concerns that you might have? I'd ask that you might fill out a prayer card, and there's a receptacle for them, either in the offering plate as you leave the service or in the receptacle in the lounge. Now let's join our hearts in prayer together. Considering the turmoil, the chaos, and everything that's going on in this world, like uh, Marian mentioned too, today I would like to share some thoughts from Susan Schutz's book, One World, One Heart. We must learn to put aside our differences and come together as one in peace, understanding, and tolerance. And to learn to understand one another we know conflicts occur, but it's in the resolution of these conflicts that human beings stand out. Every conflict should and can be calmed by talking, understanding one another's needs, and by acting with compassion to solve the differences. This is how all people should get along. And this is how we should get along. But to get along, we must remember to celebrate all that binds us together by celebrating budding flowers, the clear blue sky, the green forest, the perfect full moon, the twinkling stars, by celebrating the miracle of a baby, the optimism of children, the laughter of adolescents, the responsibility of adults, and the wisdom of our elders. Lastly, by celebrating the health of our bodies, the love in our hearts, and the spirit in our souls. Heavenly Father, may this be our prayer to remember all that binds us together as one. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Let us continue in silent prayer as we lift up what is in our hearts before God, knowing that God is here, God hears, and God answers. Thank you, Lord. We pray these things in the name of him who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the and power, power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are one in the bond of faith with Jesus Christ. And so I'd ask you to take this moment just to turn and wave at your neighbor in safe distancing. Well, wave. <laughs> God be with you. I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the beauty of my King. So I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the beauty of my King. And I love you with the love of the Lord. The secret to peace and serenity and civility is being able to see within your neighbor the image of God. Be it blemished, be it suppressed, yet it's there. And only as we recognize the beauty that God has placed within each one of us can we act in ways to lift that beauty out? May we do so. Let us now turn our attention to the reading of God's word that comes to us from Genesis 13, verses 5 through 13. This week we continue on with Abram's travels, him and Lot, even though they've left. Now, Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay. And quarreling arose among Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were, among, were living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up. He saw the whole plain of Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zor. This was before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The word of the Lord, people the word of God. Thanks be to God. Our questions of faith today. When you come to tough questions, what motivates your choices? What decisions have you made and then later regretted? And from your misguided decisions, what? Did you learn? Thank you, Tammy. We're looking.
looking at the extraordinary life of Abraham. And from the example of his life, we are seeking to glean those principles that we apply to our lives so that we too might become extraordinary people who live extraordinary lives. It is true we will not be as famous ever, probably most of us, uh, as Abraham was. If you think about Abraham's life, his life influenced so many countless thousands and millions of people. It is the Christian faith that recognize Abraham as being the beginning of our journey of faith. It is also the Islamic people, people who embrace that faith, who also look to Abraham as the beginning of their journey of faith. And of course, if you're a Hebrew, if you're a Jew, you also begin your faith journey with Abraham. We find that from his life that God is used to be able to deal with our lives. And as we look at how he lived out his walk of faith, we then learn about our walk of faith as well. Last week, we looked into the fact that God called Abram. He called him from a place of comfort. We talked about how Terah, his father, had began a journey. From Ur of Chaldea, which was a large nation, farther east and north, and then traveled, and he stopped, though, in his journey to the land of Canaan in a place called Haran. It's interesting that Haran is also shares the name of one of his sons. There was Nahor, who died, and then there was Abram, and there was Haran. I, reading this, I must ask myself the question, is there a reason why the place where he stopped was named Haran? Was it Terah that decided I wasn't going to go any further and decided to build a small city or a city there and named it in honor of his son? We do not know. But it's his curiosity. But it is then that Terah stayed there and died, but Abraham heard God speaking and continued on his journey. He said, I'm going to take you to the land of Canaan, continue the journey, and take with you everything you have, leave your family. And oftentimes in our faith journey, we also saw that sometimes we are responsible to take that journey, and sometimes there are people in our lives that will not continue that journey with us. And our journey will bring us into a place of divide. We have faith. Others who are important to us may not have that same faith. But we make a choice. We make a choice to continue that journey with God. And every place that he went, we also saw how all of a sudden Abram, not Abraham yet, but Abram, then when he stopped, he built an altar to God. So also in our journey, we make our times in different stages of our lives and we stop, and we make that an altar. Here I am, God, right here in this time and this place, with these circumstances that I did choose and some I didn't choose, many of which I did not choose. But here I give you my life, here I worship you. Right here, right now. That's what we saw last week. This week we enter into another time, in the, in the journey which Abram had, and that led him to a place of quarreling with someone, a relative that came with him, his nephew Lot. But I've left part, part of the story out because I wanted to fit the series in a certain number of weeks. And so there's another part of this story that is important to us. I would call this sermon really our teaching the tale of two children. And we learn from the choices of others. And I want to say this as we look into the Old Testament, that we learn not only from the good choices 
of the characters that are lifted up in Scripture, we also learn from their character. We also must understand that Abram and many other characters are not perfect persons of faith. Thank God for that. I don't know about you, but I'm not a perfect person of faith either. And so I am comforted that I can learn from their example both of the good and also the bad that they made. Because maybe I can see the choices they made and I can say, I'm not going to make that choice. The reason why that incident is recorded for me is so that I can learn from it and I can save myself from making the choices that may lead to greater dysfunction and separation from God and separation from my calling. Immediately after the calling, he went to Canaan. He didn't stay there. Even though God said, I'm going to give you this place. But there are other peoples that were living there, not big nations. The Canaanites, the Perizzites. We can sign all sorts of different names of people. They had their own little small city-states, but they were not large nations. Not like Egypt or Chaldea or other nations that would rise. They were small little city-states. They called themselves kings, and we'll oftentimes hear about the kings in this land of Canaan, but it was disputed territory, if you would. It was a travel route that people would go from large countries like, like Ur of the Chaldeans and travel down through along by the Mediterranean in order to get to Egypt and then have access to Africa. That's why it was so disputed and still disputed to this day. And yet we also find that Abraham was not necessarily just a shepherd. He had sheep and goats and other things, but we believe that he was a merchant. He was taking that traveling route. He and his family were a family of merchants. And they'd stop outside these city-states, and they would conduct business with these city-states. And so we find that all of a sudden, Abraham, as he was in Canaan, and God gave him a great promise. You know, I'm going to do something wonderful in your life. I'm going to make you a blessing to other nations. I'm going to bless your life in your journey. If you follow me, which requires obedience, requires a choice. Now all of a sudden, he's in I'm not going to stop along the way here. I'm going to go directly to Egypt because I know I can find the resources I need there. I can always come back. But I'm going to go and I must go to Egypt, a developed country with greater resources than what he had. Now we have to look at that choice. Here he built an altar. It's every place that he stayed. But... want me to go back? Where do you want me to go? Instead, he assessed his circumstance and he made a choice. I want to ask you in your life of faith, in your walk of faith, how many times do you really look for guidance from God or do you use the resources God has given you and you kind of weigh them and you make the choice? Does God really care about what style car you drive. I don't know if many of us pray about that. Some I, people I know have prayed about that. But that may not be a, a decision that we feel that we take to God. Oh, God, direct me. Oh, what shall I have to eat this morning? We don't necessarily we pray to God. We have grace, but we don't ask God, well, do I have sugar smacks? Or do I have cream of wheat? Now, wisdom might tell us we better have the cream of wheat instead of the sugar smacks. I had cream of wheat this morning. <laughs> but then I had also a cinnamon bun my daughter had made and put honey butter on it. Well, anyways, we won't go there. But 
you know, we oftentimes do not look at every decision that we have to make to God. So we say, okay, we leave the lesser decisions to ourselves and we, the greater decisions we give to God. The one problem with that I think that we have is sometimes there are some decisions we need to make and we do not necessarily think them through and it would be better if we did pray for them. I cannot give you a formula to looking at your life and saying, well, these decisions, I should really seek guidance from God and these decisions, you know, I trust that God has given me you know, the resources, my mind, my experiences, and I can make those choices. One reason why we had a call to worship that centered on Proverbs chapter 3 is because it says in that cha Proverbs chapter 3, trust the Lord with all your heart. Right? It goes on to say, acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make your path straight. Abram acknowledged God, acknowledged Yahweh. But he didn't always turn to God for each direction or each step of the way. And so also we do too. If we lean unto God and trust God with all our heart, with all our understanding, and acknowledge him in all our ways, then God will make our pathway clear. I'm not so sure the decision to go to Egypt was a wise one. It was a developed country, and they opened their borders to uh, merchants, of course, because they wanted that trade as well. And so they would welcome Abram, but Abram had some fears. He knew his wife was very attractive. He knew the moral state of Egypt, and he feared for his own life, and so he made a plan with his wife, Sarai. You know, you're a good-looking woman, and I know those Egyptians. They like good things. So you tell them when we come there, that you're my sister. And that's not a lie because she was his sister. He, he married his first cousin. Now, we might say in our time, well, you know, you aren't supposed to do your first cousin. Maybe your second cousin or third cousin, but that's not the issue here, you know. But he wasn't lying. And he knew that he was in fear or there was a threat. So it only seemed reasonable. And so it got back to Pharaoh that, hey, this is a good-looking woman. He liked harems because, you see, if all of a sudden I took someone, some woman as my wife, I then made a, an agreement with their family of peace, of trade. It benefited me, benefited them. It's terrible. Their world was different than our world. And we cannot judge the world of Abraham or anyone else according to our standards, because our worlds have changed. We have to understand them in their world. We would read this and say, how despicable. What else do you expect from a man who's going to abuse his, his wife, you know, put her in a compromising situation? Isn't that just like men? But you see, she didn't argue, she didn't debate. If you, when we read further in the story of Abraham, Sarah was not necessarily a silent woman, and she had her opinion. Okay? So we have to be realistic. She went along with this. Now, all of a sudden, we find that God knew it was right. And he caused a plague to come upon Pharaoh, and he protected Abram and Sarah. All of a sudden, he realized, hey, this has come on because you're the last caravan that came here, and look at all this trouble that came our way. It has to be because of you. Why didn't you tell us? I don't know how he came to know it. Why didn't you tell us that this was your wife? I wouldn't have taken her into my household. So all of a sudden, he released her. Take your wife. I don't want her. And along with that, he gave, her all, gave Abram all sorts of wealth. He was already a wealthy man. We read that as he came to Egypt with herds, with people. 
It was not a small and little caravan. And he wasn't just a nomad living out in the desert. Abram was an accomplished person, a businessman. And so all of a sudden, he became even more wealthy. Now, what do we say about this? I don't know about you, but as I look back in my past, there are some decisions that I made that I shouldn't have made. And I also know that there are times, there are consequences that I could have and should have experienced. But by the grace of God, I was spared them. Did you get that? It's by the grace of God. We find here the experience of God's grace for his people. And you and I both share in the fact that we're not perfect in our faith, our walk of faith, just like Abraham wasn't. But God has chosen us. God has placed his hand on us. And God says, you know, I'm going to save you. I'm going to bring you through. And sometimes there are some things, some consequences that you your actions and your choices should have brought upon yourself, and I'm going to save you from them. Can you recognize those times in your life? I hope you can. Now we go on to another choice, and this is all of a sudden he leaves and he has great wealth, and all of a sudden he and Lot and all his possessions, there's Canaanites and Perizzites and all these other people living in the land when he went back up to the land of Canaan, and all of a sudden, there's limited water. I've been there. There's limited oases or places of which you could then find, you know, respite and pasture. He leaves me beside green pastures. He leaves me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And all of a sudden, there was quarreling between the two clans. Lot. There were relatives. Had you have any quarrels or had any quarrels with people of your family? No? That's wonderful for you. I'm still waiting for my sister to contact me. <laughs> I've done all I can. I will still continue to reach out. But there was trouble in Abram's family. He had a choice to make. He had a bad choice he made in going down to Egypt, but then he made a good choice. You know, I can't choose for peace. I can choose for peace, but I cannot bring others to choose peace. Does that fit anything in our time, in our earthly struggles, in our time of history right now? I can decide what I'm going to do, but I can't decide what someone else is going to do and all of a sudden, he says to Lot, you know, we can't be family as we should and have this quarreling. We've got to do something about it. And the only conclusion, and he didn't pray about it again, he knew it intuitively. Do you know some things intuitively because you live close to Christ? The important thing of coming close to to Christ and to building an altar every stage of your life is that we also gain only wisdom through the word, but if we are in the word, studying the word, we gain increasing wisdom. We also have gained an intuition. I know what Jesus wants. There are times in which I don't give to Jesus what I know Jesus wants, but I know what Jesus wants a lot of times. He knew intuitively this was going to cause trouble. And so he said, I think we need to separate. But he also extended a choice to someone else. Do you extend freedom of choice to other people? I can't force people to have faith. I can't force people whom I love dearly to make the right choices. At least in my opinion, they're right choices, which may not be right. So he gave Lot choice. Now Lot, because he hung with his uncle Abram, he got used to being wealthy, having a lot. And so as he looked in the land, he saw this city, Sodom and Gomorrah down here, population, even though, as it says here, he knew they were evil. 
There was a lot of evil going there. You remember how I said now the caravans would stay outside of the city. They would provide their, their merchandise and trade, but they didn't become part of the evil. Lot, though, chose, I want to go to that place. I like my life, and I want more, and they have more, and it's lush there. I'm going to go there. You know, Abraham may have chosen to go to Egypt because it was a limited choice. It was the best choice he could make at that time. Lot, however, showed in his choice that I'd rather take the possibility of my own enrichment over that of my principles, my moral values. Lot allowed him. Abraham allowed him to make his choice. And Lot moved and put himself in danger. Sometimes we can see the danger of people we love from the choices they're making. And we can't spare them from making those choices. But we have a choice. Abram was willing to choose less, choose the hill country, a little harder life to deal with, but kept his moral integrity. Kept his moral integrity. And so as the word says here, all of a sudden God took him and says, take a walk. Take a walk. We oftentimes call our faith a walk of faith. And God said to Abram, take a walk. You see, you've made the right choice. See all this? You may not see it now, but take a walk. Because all this is yours and your family's. Walk with me. All this is yours. Because you took the higher road. You took the road of integrity. All this is yours. A tale of several choices. God gives us the freedom to choose. How do we choose? Maybe there are increasing times when we should not make the choices just on our own, that we should turn to God and ask, hey, I need to know what way I should go. But ultimately, extraordinary people make tough choices. What choice, tough choices are confronting you right now? Will you take responsibility and make those tough choices? And will you, with integrity, Continue your walk of faith. Let's pray. Gracious living God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for people that come before us. We can see through the choices that they make how you are guiding us to make choices in our lives. Help us, O oh God. Lord, I, I've played the game of faith and I now give you my, my life. All that I am, who that I am, I give to you. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to doing. Put me with whom you wilt. But my life is yours. For those of us who have been walking that faith, Lord, we want to be more faithful. Show us how to be faithful. We need you to guide us. But most of all, Make us a captive, Lord, a captive to your way, to your will, and give us courage to follow through on that choice and live this day with you and for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you rise to your feet if you are able and join me in our closing hymn, Make Me a Captive, Lord, and may this also be our prayer together.
captive Lord, and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword, and I shall conquer be. I sink in life's alarms when by myself I stand. Imprison me within thine arms, and strong shall be my head. My heart is weak and poor until its master fought. It has no spring of auction shore, it varies with the wind. It cannot freely move till thou hast wrought its chains. Enslave it with thy matchless love, and deathless it shall reign. My power is faint and low till I have learned to serve. It lacks the needed fire to glow. It lacks the breeze to serve. It cannot drive the world until itself be driven. Its flag can only be unfurled when thou shalt breathe from heaven. My will is not my own till thou hast made it thine. If it would reach a monarch's throne, it must its crown resign. It only stands unbent amidst the clashing sky when on thy bosom it has lent and found in thee its life. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his faith to fill you. May he inspire you, may he guide you, and may he imprison you. Not behind bars, but may he imprison you within the grip of his loving arms. For there is where we find true security. Amen. Have a good and godly day.